And we're live. Hello, everybody from beautiful Whangarei, New Zealand. Another wonderful day. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there and all you um, new fathers. Uh, it's going to be a trial and an, um, of full of error and full of happiness and joy and emotions up and downs. But of course, nobody expects uh, the unexpected. So, you know, be ready for the unexpected and um, try your best and to raise good kids. And build up with good principles because after, without principles, we're just floundering in the world without any uh, steps to take and how to climb that ladder to be better people. So tonight, uh, I have with me Olivia. I will not say her try to even pronounce her surname because I have no idea how to pronounce it. So I'm going to let her pronounce it herself. Olivia uh, Olivia uh, works with Creative Northland, and I'm going to let her. Uh, talk about herself, and then we'll go into about Creative Northland and how the nonprofit, which I didn't even know was a nonprofit, works in Whangarei. And they do a great job. They're a, a quite a, a chief pro, a sponsor of what we do with Plunge. And uh, and it's, um, it's always the reason we actually got Plunge started was because of the uh, CEO of Creative Northland, Hinu, who actually uh, – Put the idea to do a convention in my head way back in 2018. So it's good to see um, from the start to the finish to where we've actually developed into the stage now where we've actually um, become a actual legitimate thing here in Whangarei. So thank you to Hinu and thank you Olivia for joining us tonight and um, let's get on with it. Let's find out. Tell us about yourself. All right. Um, thank you for having me, um, Aru. So um, yeah, I'm Olivia Garalja. Um, a descendant of Croatian, so I'm 100% Croatian here up in Northland. i um, been up here now for about three and a half years and absolutely loving it. Never found a place that feels like more home. Um, my background um, was grew up in the um, beautiful Waitakere Ranges in West Auckland. Um, we're surrounded by nature. Uh, I guess that's where my creative curiosity started, um, understanding how to work different elements of nature together to build huts. Um, wanted to be an architect, ended up doing a Bachelor of Graphic Design at AUT and getting first class honours in design and focusing on photography. And I guess that's where the curiosity kind of entangled through my life, always focusing on that microcosm world, that world beyond what we normally see and how can we kind of educate others to see that world differently. That was kind of like my focus. So I started off, I guess, being relatively shy and my challenge to myself was how can I as a creative make it in the real world? Um, I'm trying to understand, I guess, what being creative means and how we can contribute to other industries. So as much as I did graphic design, I realised quite early on in the university stage that I didn't really want to be stuck behind a computer. I wanted to know more about the world. So I decided event photography was to start me off. Um, so my first kind of job was photographing the All Blacks um, and all their PR tours around Auckland and Hamilton. Um, and that was really interesting because being creative, often we're quite introverted and quite shy. So it's about how to challenge them that when you're, you know, surrounded by these people and you meet to get these key shots um, to get paid at the end of the day. So it really kind of pushed me outside my comfort zones. Um, to interact with people I wouldn't usually interact with to get these top shots. Um, and it's it's interesting because when you are creative and you're surrounded by non-creatives, they kind of teach you a lot about yourself. Um, and that kind of pushed me into other areas, like how could I, as a painter also, make it in, that, in the creative industry. So I actually ended up getting a job as a mural artist at Rainbow's End, um, and I was still able to do some work for them up here while I was in Whangarei, which is fantastic. And it just goes to prove that, the, I guess the importance of being an artist and attaining relationships over time and how important it is for an artist to actually value themselves and get out there but yeah retain those relationships because that is key I think to success um, in the creative industry and all others as well. Ended up also stepping out of my comfort zone into the IT world and um, being a team leader for Google New Zealand, focusing on the merchandising rollout. So again, that little bit of creativity there within a retail space and understanding how effective or non-effective that could be. But it's also understanding as a creative the way we look at the world differently um, and how we push limits and boundaries and see things differently from a product point of view um, within the marketplace. And then also working with Lenovo into account management role 
Um, and again, um, building confidence around connecting people and building relationships, um, you know, with, with big players in the market. Um, you know, you've got Noel Lemming, JBs, your Harveys, and all those people in between um, that are part of that journey. Uh, it's about getting that product seen and understanding how that product is understood and educated within that scene. And then also jumped into uh, Noel Lemming, a little bit of operations there, um, customer experience. Uh, understanding, I guess, from a customer point of view, how they see the world and product, um, and also focusing on management. And management it was really interesting, I guess, from coming from that shy creative background, um, understanding different personalities that creatives have and how we interact with others. Um, so there's heaps of learning curves around that um, and how we can apply ourselves in other areas, which I think was a, was a key um, takeaway from that. And then I moved up here and decided I really wanted to stay true to who I really was, which was creative. Um, you know, as much as sometimes you can go into these other industries and, and earn a great amount of money, it's, it's not really about the end of the day. It's about staying true to yourself, your creative core, and understanding what that means. So I jumped into the sign writing industry, which is fantastic because that kind of drilled that whole design aspect that I already had um, and also the application in vinyl and working with 3D surfaces and, and, and different surfaces all together. So that was a really, really fascinating. Um, but I did, I guess, miss a little bit of that relationship building sign that I'd had in all those other roles. So then jumping into creative um, Northam when the role came up as creative team lead, it just kind of felt right. Um, and so I'm really excited uh, to, I guess, yeah, be part of the team. Um, and, and what does that mean for me? I think it's about coming into a creative industry that I'm so passionate about. Um, and it's about creating, I think, improvement. Um, being a creative industry is sometimes hard to understand what an organisation does until you get behind it, yeah, and you get to peel back all the layers. Uh, so for me, it's about, I guess, that development of transparency with the creative community, who, and again, as you know, it's, it's as large as probably 13 genres, if not more. So it's about, yeah, breaking that down um, to be easily understood from a creative perspective. So again, because you're dealing with creatives all the different types, but it's how best to communicate what we do as a non-for-profit with them. So there's probably going to be just some development around some infographics to understand where people can fit into the system, so to speak. And not really a system, but just where they feel that they can reach out to us and, and where we the play, I guess the game that we play too, um, with reaching out to the community and, and what we do. So um, yeah, that gives a, a bit of a background about me. Um, Aru, where was that? Bit different. Um, do you want me to just tackle the, the creative Northland side? Here we go. All right. So I just took myself out of there because I wanted to have you speak. And I think that's that's basically amazing, um, good introduction to about who you are. And um, hey, I was going to ask, um, now, were you born in New Zealand or did, uh, did you come here as a, as a young no, child so, like myself? No, um, so born here, parents were born here. It's just grandparents on both sides and um, that were born back in Croatia, yeah. Okay. So uh, whereabouts in Croatia is your uh, family from? Pogra. Oh, Pogra. Now, I've heard of the name. Tell us about it. If, you know, do you know much about about? I've been Pogra? there once in 2008 with family, and it was amazing. So, ah, oh, it takes you back to your history. It's, I think it's really good that we kind of start asking questions to our parents about where we come from. Um, I think it all instills with who we are as people, you know, what our ancestors have gone through. Um, so, yeah, part of my, I guess, history from back, I think, to the Ottoman Empire, uh, my family escaped, I think, something, and we ended up in the hills in the mountains of top of Croatia, um, Bogomoya there. And then, um, yeah, we ended up coming down to the coast because obviously that's where it was all, all the power is back on, so noise is going to start happening. Um, and then, um, yeah, because that's where the fish was and that's where community was. So, yeah. They've still got a, an old stone house that they made over there, which is really amazing to go back and actually understand your footsteps off your ancestors and, and how they lived. 
um, the language and everything, just the culture, uh, it's just fascinating. And it was due to the wars that ended up coming to New Zealand mm. um, and originated up in um, Northlands doing gun digging. And then they got into orcharding down in West Auckland. So there's that really strong tie, I guess, of yeah, families that kind of had to really strive to work hard and 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 find place um, within a country. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of people. I mean, a lot of times they think. I mean, that you know, you're just here, and it's just everything's um, bells and whistles. You know, you've come with lots of money and. You're already set up and it's so to go. But I, I, uh, the whole gum digging and uh, perspective of gold, you know, that sort of thing all across New Zealand, I mean, allow people to be able to, who had no skills, I mean, or who did have skills in other areas, to just basically get their hands dirty and try to make a living to make a better life for themselves and to their future generations of, you know, um, Children and children's children, yeah. the children's children. And um, a couple of years ago, well, I think it was must have been about 2014 or maybe earlier than that, when my uncle took me around Fiji uh, and said, This is where our grand, um, my dad grew up. And then we went around, he said, In this little valley where it's full of sugarcane. There used to be a little house in the, right in the middle there. There's no house there now. And he said, this is where you, you know, your mom was born. And then we moved here and then here and here and here and here. And it's like, I never knew this until it was, you know, it was told to us. And like yourself, you know, being able to go back to Croatia and I mean, they, they did the same thing. You know, this is, like you said, this is where you were from and um, where your family were from and your lineage goes all the way back. Did you, um, how did that feel like to be able to um, become aware of, you know, your roots, as they say? I think it was, um, it just kind of blew me away a little bit. I think just that history that remained within the family and I think that that place of knowingness um, to be able to walk in, I think, in their footsteps that your, you know, your, your great grandparents and your ancestors have, I think is really important for a sense of self. Um, it, it, I think there's so much told and, going back to the history and, and kind of knitting together, I guess, who you are as a person and potentially it's those things that have travelled through genetically, potentially, um, just those, that tacit knowingness or intrinsic knowledge, I think. Um, you know, and whether that links into why I don't like olives, I'm not sure, or um, certain foods, you know, from the country that you just despise. I'm like, oh, how can you yeah. do that? But um, I think, yeah, just... Yeah, so many things tie in, I think, to understanding history and culture. And, yeah, I, I think it's so good that everyone should actually be asking those these questions. And I think mm. having those conversations to start with, I think, beyond just the ancestry.com or whatever, just finding the links, but just having the conversations with people who are still alive um, that you may not necessarily think to even communicate with. Mm. Yeah. I um I did that with my grandmother a few years back and. uh I sat her down and we started um, interviewing her and this is before she passed away in 2014 and said, or even with my uncle, I said, give us the nits and grits of well, about our family history because I have no idea. I always believed we were in Fiji forever, you know, and mm -hmm. suddenly you realize, and I realized in 24, uh, 2005 and my, my um, brother who's younger than me goes uh well i've got two younger brothers and um and one of them goes uh who's born in new zealand who's a kiwi and he goes um did you know this history i said dude i left fiji when i was seven i have no idea about anything didn't even have any tertiary education or, or secondary education formally to be aware about the history of fiji i didn't even know what fiji history was all i knew was that uh, what was the um you know with the Newspapers were telling us about history at that time, which was like uh, in, with 82 with the coup and stuff like that, 84. And that was the whole show about, about Fiji. And just living as a kid, you'd have no idea about anything. And you're just like running around in the fields going, you know, uh, fighting with sugarcane sticks, you know, and mm. that's it. And you're going to primary school, getting, a, you know, having your lunch, going home, playing soccer. And I think um, having, asking the questions of our, um, you know, of our parents and grandparents, it's a really good way to actually get a um, understanding of who we are ourselves because it tells us um, 
what our uh, where we stand in because I think knowing ourselves helps us to have a, uh, a kind of like a steadfastness about who we are and so we don't get swayed too easily by things around us I think uh, mm-hmm. I found that for myself anyway when I when I when I found out about what uh, where Indians came from and how they ended up in Fiji I was like right and then I started five years of studies about it and then I thought now I'm going to make a comic about it and write about it and so on and I think um did you have that sort of um, element as well like now you've known about this and come to an understanding yeah and I think there's ever I think it's just as you develop and grow older I feel like there's that that drawing of wanting to be feel more connected wanting to speak the language something which I've you kind of learn growing up but you don't really understand the importance until you're older so um yeah meaning my partner he's like oh we need to learn Croatian and yeah so um that's on my to-do list along with Te uh because the understanding of the Māori and the Dalmatians um together up in Northland there was this Mm. really strong understanding of this this cultural unity about family and connection um and hard work as well so yeah I think part of that's understanding how we can relate to other cultures and and finding those common grounds those common threads and that we like to talk about, but yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and I think it, it also for, through food, you know, it's right. understanding um, art form and the connections there, but also with food um, and the the conversation that takes place and that sense of place. I think along with food is, a, is an interesting concept, but um, it's often something that draws conversations out between families and and time and place. So yeah. You're right about the food thing because, like, I mean, you look at the hangi uh, when when the when you're putting down the hangi, there's a whole bunch of people around and you're mm. conversing and you're talking. It's the same thing with lovu in Fiji, you know, uh, with Fijian culture. It's the same process where it's a, where in Fiji it's above ground um, uh, ground cooking, whereas in New Zealand it's below ground cooking. But it's the same process of steamed food, and um, and you're having conversations you wouldn't have just sitting next to each other around you know having a beer or something but when you're putting the food down you're going this is why we do this this is how this thing comes in and this is why you you know you layer the sack over it and then you put soil over it and you learn about the processes of it did you when you were uh, you know when you were in Croatia did you take photog- um, you know ph- photographs of you know the landscape and stuff and did you decide what well, you know I could have a uh, exhibition of this work or uh yes um I just actually got my, I think, 415D Canon camera. And, yeah, at that time, it was early in my, I think it was, yeah, first year at university. And I didn't get to do photography at high school. So, again, it was my first kind of overseas experience using photography as a medium to explore creativity. And I just had this obsession with doors at the time. So every antique door I walked past, I ended up photographing it. And absolutely, I was like, oh, my God, this is like multiple worths of exhibitions right here um, and also rocks like I have this fascination with rocks and stones and and different ground that's grounds that we walk on so there was a lot of feet on different surfaces and um, and whatnot but it, it, yeah it's really interesting I think there was more photographing textures and surfaces than there were probably of people as at that time but um yeah that was just me at the time yeah awesome um now you did um IT work with Google uh, do you want to talk about that a bit and what that was like? Yeah, so initially I went into it um, as a team leader for New Zealand, just focusing on product placement and the retail stores. So we were focusing on JB, Noel Lemming, Harvey Normans, um, and a few others at the time. And a, and a lot of it was just around that relationship factor um, and educating staff on through technology about what, what we're selling New mm. Zealand, basically. Um, and I think that was just at the start, you know, when you could you could cast things onto your TV and extended screens and 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 what that meant for people. Um, so it was really interesting, I think, to just be part of behind the scenes, I guess, how we were communicating with staff and stores about how they're selling product um, and what that meant for New Zealand as a whole to extending our technology bubble. Um, we had the Nexus phone, I think, at the time as well, but also extending that into, you know, your trade shows like your Armageddon um, and, and what that looked like there as well. Um, but it was just a great platform, I think, to be representing brands. Um, at that time, that was probably 2012, 2011, 2012. Um, 
And again, it's working with, you know, a merchandising team from all over New Zealand. So it's about managing standards, yeah. Mm. Um, you know, the shop in Auckland's not going to look necessarily the same as the shop in Invercargill. So ha- how are you managing that presence and understanding about product, you know, dollars per square metre, what does that look like? And as a creative person, it's kind of like putting that into perspective as well. Uh, it's not often that we think um, as a creative, as, as our art is business, but sometimes we probably need to. Um, so it's about, yeah, I guess understanding the essence of value in product and messaging and what that looks like, especially from a marketing point of view. So it was a really interesting space to be in and um, totally privileged just just amazing relationships um, gained from from that time that I was there. And, um, yeah, going to the headquarters in Sydney was fantastic. Meeting, I guess, Google teams over there and just, yeah, just seeing, I guess, the opportunities that were there within that IT um, world of retail. Um, but also understanding, reflecting back on New Zealand and seeing how small we are to the overall footprint. So, yeah, there's... Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. Um, there's definitely heaps of potential here in New Zealand, but it's also about allowing um, those other countries to understand that potential and to also provide us with the same amount of level of, um, of goods, whether it be marketing or, or whatever. So, yeah, interesting, interesting space to be in. With um, being a creative and trying to um, – and having worked in commercial areas, because like the you know you're the business, and then you got the creative side of it. How did you feel trying to um, meld that together? Yeah, it was it was interesting from the point that as a creative, we're able to look at boundaries a little bit differently. We're able to visualize structure a little bit differently, and we're able to approach things differently. Um, I think there's a sensitivity there of understanding um, from a creative point of view um, in how we interact with with people. But also I think it's it's about having that kind of observer kind of view of the world, how we, we are, we're very good at being the fly on the wall, yeah, and observing things from far back and being able to maybe see those intricacy levels where things could be improved. So I think, yeah, that, that was probably, I guess, a, a big insight for me, and, but also a passion point, yeah? It's about improving the way we do things, and that's what I'm really passionate about. So, yeah. Now, um, you said you worked in a retail or management position, and um, being an introvert, you know, how did do, how do that feel to be coming out of um, – because I used to work in sales for about almost 10 years – and so I understand my side of it, but like, how was it? Because I'm not an introvert. So how does it, um, how do you as an introvert work through uh, actually having to be a, you know, extro- extrovert? Yeah. Um, through not learning, they had a great uh, system of putting you through like, like a leadership kind of course and or management course to help figure out who you were. And I think that's a lot of it. Eh? It's about diving deep within to figure out exactly who you are. So uh, uh, one thing that I found really fantastic through that course was the MBTI um, personality test. We kind of, there's like 16 different personalities and you figure out through a various of series of questions exactly where you fit. And that helps identify your strengths and weaknesses, but also helps, the, you know, the course helps you push you through different areas of, of weakness or strength. Um to kind of force you through to have these experiences so you can improve them for the next time. But, yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is you just stepping outside your comfort zone um, and just working through, I guess, any stress points or, yeah, any fears, I think. Um, and at the end of the day, I think being a creative, a lot of us are perfectionists, yeah? So mm. we, don't, we don't want to fail people. Um, so it's about what does that look like? How can how can I challenge that? What is that going to look like for me? Could could I potentially step outside being a creative? What happens if one day I didn't want to be a creative and what I had left was potentially working in a retail store? You know, mm-hmm. um, asking those kind of tough questions. And yeah, again, <laughs> throughout everything I think I've done, there's always just been that that strength of creativity to the core that always kind of drew me back to reflecting back on potentially what I could be doing in the future. So, 
yeah, having an introvert into that kind of industry, I, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of them out there, and I think it's mm-hmm. something you just have to personally work through. It's like the more you do something, the less fearful it becomes, yeah? So it's about just putting yourself out there to have those, a lot of experiences, good or bad, but you just learn positively from each one. Tell, um, tell us about this MBTI thing, because I thought, uh, you know, because everybody expects everybody um, to be the same. And, um, you know, I know I'm not the same as everybody else. And so um, I took a test a long time ago, probably about almost two decades ago, about to realize that I'm a totally different, I work totally differently. And so my brain works totally differently. How did you, um, what, you know, having, being a team manager, how did it feel to um, work with other people who might not have been the same as you? Yeah, challenging, I think, at times. Um, It's understanding sometimes when to take a breath and to step back and to not Mm -hmm. jump into something. I think that was probably the biggest biggest hurdle. Um, But to understand at the end of the day, it's about, not trying to necessarily tell someone what you want them to do, but for you to actually get them on your level or you on their level to understand exactly how to get what you want to be done achieved. Mm. Um, and I think a, a lot of it's not necessarily about pointing a finger and I need this done, I need this done now, um, but it's about working with them, maybe understanding what else they have on their plate is probably the biggest thing. It's about being on that same level. Um, I guess that's where I can probably stress the most. Um, but being, I think, reasonable and and having people understand the outcome for why they're doing something, I think that's the biggest, you know, um, how it's going to affect them or how it's going to improve what they're doing. And that's where that whole educational side comes into it. It's not just about doing, it's about understanding the reason why we do things. All right, let's move along to um, the Creative Northland um, itself and um, the organisation there. So you're a creative team leader. Oh, yeah. right. So what does that job entail? Um, yep, so I've just been in there for the last um, three and a bit months now. And I guess what that entails is, I guess as a non-for-profit, we have two different ways of working. There's a, a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach, yeah? And mm-hmm. it's about not until you get into the industry or the organisation, you get to see all the different layers that are involved. And I guess for me, it's... Um, creative development team lead it's about looking at probably from a strategy point of view operational point of view the way we can probably do things you know better or differently you know especially to post-covid you know you've got a whole lot of resilience coming that we've seen within the creative world and how can we deal with that better you know we've got so many ideas coming out and about um, with events and just ideas that we're wanting to help bring to life throughout the whole region so it's how can we either collaborate more or connect the dots with different areas in the region on artists themselves um, and, and enrich, and I think, the region creativity in general. So, yeah, it's it's, it's varied. <laughs> but we, we've got a team. We've got, obviously, um, Hino, the GM, and then um, we've got creative advisor as well. So Jolene Pascoe is coming on board um, for that. Um, and then we've got our marketing person, Mariah, as well. And we've got a couple of interns. As, and so it's just managing all of the different facets of all the roles that we kind of do and just, you know, being that kind of person of checkpoint to make sure that, yeah, we're still on the right path. We're still, we're still all got on the right goals, um, setting the right goals, achieving the, the right areas and aspects there. So, yeah. How has it been working with uh, with the COVID system? Because I know that like you can't do so many um, a lot of because art is all about having a lot of people eyes and audience in the place looking at exhibitions, uh, going to um, uh, stage pl- uh, plays, um, you know, concerts and so forth. How has it been to try to organize in a way that you that can't you know limit that sort of movement? Yeah. Um been challenging we had a, a business after five events that was meant to happen a few weeks back and um, it was the same day that you know we were put into level was it level two level three one of two, um, two and we just had to make that kind of decision that we just couldn't go ahead due to the the type of building we we're in um, and where we were to invite you know potentially 100 people where we were to put like dots on the floor and have everyone at a two meter distancing or how is that mm. interaction going to take place so I, I guess it gets us thinking about events differently and how potentially they can occur in the future for sure 
given the amount of events that have had to cancel in the last few months. Um, you know, that's a massive ecosystem of dollars there that's not coming into the community through these events. So it's looking at ways potentially that they can take place in a different form, you know, mm. in the future. Um, so we've now got our BA5 happening on the 31st or 30th, I think, of September on the Wednesday. So that should be interesting. And again, um, if we're still at level two, we'll be really looking at the way of the strategy of COVID at level two and how that looks. Mm. How can we do it? Um, you know, it's it's looking at potentially reducing the amount of people um, to under 100 to making sure that works. Um, I was just at Shane Hansen's exhibition on, at Hihiawa on Friday, and so there was only 100 people allowed in that space at that mm. time. Um, but it almost creates kind of like this, I don't know, um, this, I think, excitement about being first in almost because um, we yeah. were there and there were people waiting outside and it was kind of like this excitement, cold, you know, really enjoy it, come on in now, come on, I'm going to leave now kind of thing. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of conversations that I think taking place. But, hey, you know, you've got the apps now on board um, and that's fantastic to allow ev everyone easy access just to, to sign in that way. Um, yeah. How does um, Creative Northland uh, raise funds um, to help artists? Yeah. Uh, there's heaps of different ways. Um, we kind of, I guess it all starts with a conversation first to figure mm -hmm. out what you're trying to achieve, um, mm -hmm. whether that be working within an, a, a, to create a community event or your mm -hmm. own exhibition. Um, so we work in ways where we can start brokering relationships for you um, or looking at funds necessarily that you may need. So we'll might put to you like a project proposal where you fill out um, exactly what you're after and then we can look potentially to see if we could fund it internally or whether we point you in the direction of like a creative community scheme that's put on by the district council or community grant, um, depending what it is. Um, we also help out with in-kind contributions, so to do with marketing. So we offer it up to $500 free in-kind contribution there, so that's poster printing. It, you know, it's a great thing just to help someone get off the ground and, and, and share the voice of what they're doing. Um, and that's also online marketing as well within um, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And we can also, I guess, help along the lines with strategy development as well from a biz creative business point of view, which is really exciting space to be in. And um, not many people, I guess, know about, I guess, yeah, the, the development that can happen within strategy and business over time. So, yeah, it's exciting space. Um, what other things? Well, and also I, resources. I was, thinking, I was thinking more on the line of where does the money for Creative Northern come from that they can then help other um, artists? So it's like before the artists get anything, where does the money that Creative Northern actually acquire from? Um, is it from like Creative, North, uh, Creative New Zealand or Creative Community Scheme? That sort of thing, because is it like, um, or are there philanthropists out there who actually say, you know, I want to help my community and um, they're the artists in our community, here's such and such amount and, you know, you guys know better what to do with it. Uh, where does it come from? Because I think when you okay. when you say you're a non-profit, it's really, you know, it's like, well, they're not a business as such, but they are. So where does the money come from for the help others is my, my query there. Yeah. So we have um, Whangarei District Council, which mainly funds us. Um, mm. And then it's I think we have part of it is funding that is allocated for internal projects mm. um, that we can then allocate. It's making sure basically that any project that comes in effectively aligns with the strategy to be able to be funded. And then there's also Foundation North as well. Um, there's, I think, oh, I'm not too, too across it. So sorry, there, I might have to. Mm. Yeah, but there's there's heaps of different agencies out there. Um, but Excellent. that's, from what I understand, is our, our main ones. And then we're also mm. looking to launch a, a fund based on the back of COVID and, and the need for um, creative support out there. So that's going to be um, Northland's Future Fund, which will be yeah looking at getting local funding. Um, from those who really want to support the creative community. But it, it, it comes a little bit from everywhere. Um, it, yeah, I guess it yeah, it just really depends the alignment of what you want to do. I was on um, I was on a hui yesterday um, put on by uh, Alan Zier of Chromacon, uh, and he was and he had um, Sarah 
Sarah from uh, Creative um, New Zealand talking about the visual side of um, what they do. And I was uh, so I was wondering um, in line with that whether uh, I mean Creative North of New Zealand is one of our biggest you know government funded um, yeah. I guess um, arts fund bodies. And um, so seeing you know seeing their process of it, it reminded me quite similar of what how Creative Northland works as well. You know, like a lot of people um, from my talks with Lenny back in 2018, uh, you know, when we were getting, you know, sitting down to talk about this, was like when someone comes in, they don't really have a clear idea of what they want. And so uh, because they don't know what, what they, um, you know, they have an idea of what they want to do, but they don't know the process of how to get to it. And I, I learned that coming to you guys um, and talking with Lenny over the, um, the past two years or so, really help figure out the ins and outs of how and why, where the business side of things, you know, you, you think like, I'll just put on this thing and everybody <laughs> will come and then you go, well, so what's the marketing? What's your marketing budget? How are you going to advertise it? Do you have a Facebook page? Do you have a website? Uh, who's yeah. your people, you know? And it's, it's interesting because I went from being a single, single, per, um, single, business whatever idea person to having a team of five now and then outside of the having another 10 who actually work with me and it's like all right so that moment when i walked in and you know me and um henry had a talk was just me <laughs> you know and yeah. now two years in we got so much more and i think the great thing about having someone like red northern is sitting down and actually talking through the idea and i think because artists are so emotional people you know and uh and because it's all about passion and we have this is my artwork you everybody should see it to um so how, what's your cost of getting any everybody to see it how much you gonna sell it for and i found that very interesting and um you know and learning through the process i mean like when we went to um this year with covert we had to drop our prizes by three dollars per person and it was like right can we handle that and it was like mm -hmm. it doesn't matter we have we got to get out and do it because it's you know it's a year it's a, we have to do it every, we plan to do it every year so we got to do it every year whether we lose or we don't and i think at the end of the day it was like well business is business and you just got to keep moving on and i think a lot of um um artists when they're told well you have to produce 24 art every you know before you can do the exhibition they go yeah, that's going to take a lot of time. And it's like, and they, you know, even myself, I was like, I want to do 12 pieces of this. And I'm like, I'm still haven't got past four pieces, you know, and it's been yeah. two years. And I think um, having Creative Northern there to discuss and work through to get to the final stage is uh, awesome. And I think I, I love having the, uh, I mean, having that dialogue all the time of um, having someone who knows more about the, um, the business side of it, like yourselves, then myself as an artist going, yeah, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to do. And then going, I only have four pieces. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you should just wait until you get the 24 pieces, then you can have an exhibition. Did you, how do you deal with people like myself? Like, I mean, who's like, has all these grand ideas, but at the end of the day, how do you bring it down to reality? Yeah, interesting, yeah, interesting question. question. I think, I think, it's about, it's about um, potentially and dealing with the artist when they're at those stages. Um, if, if they feel that's where they want to be, then maybe it's worth putting them in connection with a collaboration potentially. Um, so, it, it, again, you, you mentioned a good point. You know, you can't really rush an artist in terms of what they're wanting to create. So it's about maybe working through a timeline or a, a time frame of, I don't know, keeping them in check over maybe five years. Um, yeah, talking to them about what is maybe a realistic time frame for them. Um, I haven't had too many conversations about that, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, I think just being a body of of of, of value and people that are there, I think just to check in every now and then for advice or yeah, to see how you're going. But um, if it's to do with an amount of body of work, I think that's when it's kind of like okay, there's probably you're not the only one in the in your shoes you know that's when it's like that opportunity arises well i know you from here you from here you from here and let's create a, a group show um and, and strengthen that 
strengthen, I guess, that cre- creative voice. Um, yeah, very interesting. But no, you mentioned some really good points mm-hmm. about understanding how to fit in and, and where we, how we work as well. And I think that's part of my journey within these, you know, next few months is to figure out what that looks like in terms of an infographic. So mm-hmm. instead of having that same conversation 10,000 times with all these people, it's about having a, a, maybe a poster or something, depending what stage of the, with the art making you're at. So you can figure mm-hmm. out exactly at that point when you feel you can come talk to us, even though it's at any point, you know, but it's understanding, okay, when, when do I reach out as a creative? Um, where have I got to that stage of what I want to do next whether it's how much do I sell my piece of artwork for um, how much do I value that piece um, what's the proposition within the community you know um, what's the meaning but it's, it's really interesting because we're talking about like physical art yeah of making but it's so much more it's about the poetry it's about this, yeah. the songwriting the storytelling it's all those other genres that we kind of I guess don't necessarily talk about um, so I guess that opens up a big can of worms as to how we want to be, yeah, transparently showing showing that infographic to them as well. But I think it's a creative, a really awesome space, I think, to be working in at the moment, and there's only room for improvement. I think collaboration uh, is probably key to that and the success of um, building, you know, Northland's creative sector for sure. Now, you were talking about cre- um, group shows and um, collaborations. Now, with uh, with the Quest um, Hotel in town, um, mm-hmm. so the art space there. Now, I've I've been to a couple of those shows there, and they're really great. Seeing different artists put their work out that I've never seen their work before. Of, and it's um, so. This is where it comes to when the artist doesn't have tons of work ready for their own solo exhibition. This works really well. So, how long have you guys been doing this? Oh, I think it's been for at least probably the last four years, probably five, probably more. Um, that's almost like a Lenny question there. Um, but, you yeah, know, it, it's great because you, you see all these emerging artists or mid-tier artists who, you know, and it's just a great opportunity for those who may not want to create a body of work and may just have one. Um, and it, it's cool because we've been working with um, Fungley District Council on themed weeks. So you've got... Um, what was it? I think it was Sea Week, um, all these different things where you can basically invite artists to contribute based on that theme. Um, mm. And therefore you get like such an array of diversity coming in. But it's also, I guess, it's thinking about those spaces and how can we use them differently for the different genres as well. So that will be part of, I guess, my development going forward is to think, you know, how can we extend this beyond just the painted image or the photograph, you know? Mm. With uh, with COVID and stuff like this, and um, especially I know having you know um, the fact we can't have so many huge uh, ex- um, you know open space um, open space uh, indoor events. Where do you see um, like especially now because we can't be at events, right? I mean, especially in New- mm. um, in Auckland where it's like you know mainly shut down. Uh, how do we? Um, how do you guys see yourselves working with artists to um, get them to be more, vis- you know, get out there more yeah. than to just be in the room? You know, here, here's the exhibition hall. How do you guys work now compared to, you know, say, um, start of a year? I think yeah, we're definitely in, in a process of of looking at that differently and brainstorming about the opportunities that even you know online things bring about. Um, online platforms, you know, podcasts talking about. Um, people, those who who, who do storytelling, um, and and what that looks like in a conversation piece. Um, but also, I guess from a gallery point of view or exhibition point of view, it's about yeah, looking at those platforms online and and I guess engaging with a different kind of audience. Yeah, extending that audience and understanding the value that audience could potentially bring to that genre as well. Mm. You, has it been um, like? I know because I was looking so much forward to the, um, you know, last month's Wednesday night event. Or was it like the month before? No, it was last month. And suddenly that um, that morning, suddenly realizing, I think it was that night or something, that it's not going to happen. I felt like, de- I mean, I was de- devastated. It was like, yes, finally we can go hang out and just, you know, coming off um, plunge. Now we can go hang out and have a beer, have some chirps, you know, you have some um, sandwiches and stuff and talk about, you know, what, you know, what we have achieved and something's like, 
uh, it's not happening. Do you find the same thing happening with artists who were like really planning to do stuff, you know, within this last two months? And how do you deal with them saying, you know, hey, no, no, we can't do that. Do they, you know, has there been a struggle with artists in this situation or um, dealing? Um, if anything, it's probably, um, good question. Um, if anything, it's probably the floods that have come to mind most. Um, you know, like the shutter room finding out that they were flooded, so exhibitions had to be postponed and finding spaces for that to happen. Um, in terms of artists, like yeah. For us. yeah. Yeah, and, and I think the there's probably yeah. more artists coming out of the wanting to display work. So it's about mm. understanding how can we support those. And again, that's looking at our local spaces differently and, and mm. seeing what is actually out there beyond what we usually use. Um, you know, like like old, old, you know, just shops that aren't aren't being tenanted, and how mm. potentially can we transform those? Um, so it's, I think it just raises a whole lot of new questions that we're not used to dealing with here, and it's pushing mm. us outside the comfort zone to think about these opportunities differently within our community. And but it also, I think it, it it goes to show that maybe you know it's it's worth us asking our community again what they want to see during these times, mm. during COVID. Um, you know, how they want to access the creative work from the community. Um, yeah. How is, um, like, you know, I'm, I'm, because it's a new environment we're in with um, with what's going on, how, like, and you've, the other thing is you guys have moved into a new, um, in the middle of all this, you've moved into a <laughs> yeah. new, um, new building. So tell us about, how, you know, um, Organizing a totally different building compared to where you were settled before, because you you're now at the railway station, and uh, you know uh, you're ready to go, and suddenly you're hit with this. And how yeah, how is it all working there at the new space? And um, the new space at the old railway station uh, next to the men's shed in Whangarei is fantastic. It has this beautiful old historic aura to it, and I think it fits in really well with our his, historic and cultural kind of um, strategy as well. But it's about Again, it's that kind of time COVID puts on you, and regardless of COVID, it's a time of reflection. Yeah, it's it's unpack, it's having to pack up everything and move it from one location to the other, and in doing so, what's unveiled during that process, you know, you find the history of of chart and creative Northland, um, how that all started started, and it's about I guess restructuring what place looks like, um, how an office is going to be laid out, um, what it may encompass. It, it's thinking about, I guess, customer or community experience within that space as well. And I think just the beauty that adds to it, the fact that it is at our old railway station, you've got the platform there, which is currently being renovated, which will be the front entrance into mm. um, the space. But I think just how we can support the creative community differently. You know, it's about constructing a creative space um, mm. that talks, talks volumes and that starts those questions rolling. Uh, we were quite lucky in one of the spaces. It's kind of like three rooms that we encompass. Um, and one of the spaces um, opens opportunity potentially for a space for workshops or, or hot desking or something like that. Mm. So it's about, yeah, thinking about the, the new ideation of Creative Northland and what that could look like. So a very exciting time. And I think it's, you know, when you move, there's a lot of positive energy around that and people wanting to drop in and, yeah, it's about, I think, reuniting and rehaving those connections again. So, yeah. On, honestly, like on a, on, a, on a weekly basis, how many artists um, do you guys deal with uh, in Northland? Because, like, where is, uh, how far do you guys cover uh, the regionally, region wise with, uh, with Creative Northland? So, basically, Kaipara all the way up to the whole of Northland, really. Um, Mangafai, Kaipara, all the way um, right to the Cape, really. Um, Mangafai as well. Um, mm. What we're kind of trying to focus on is, is really reaching out to those those regions. It, it, it's, it's kind of hard because when you've got a, an office in the middle of Whangarei, you kind of get drawn to just, you know, stay there almost. But it's about pushing outside those comfort zones. So we've just created a new little initiative where we're at the seed in Dargaville, um, once a month so that's the start of things to come you know and what is that mm. going to look like if we're in Kaikoe for once a month or, or Mangapai for once a month and it's about yeah. you know reconnecting um, and also you know going up to Kaitaia, Kiri Kiri Pai here and just seeing what that looks like it's about 
yeah, just being able to connect um, and strengthening that creative voice and that resource that we have um, and allowing those to understand what that is. But in terms of how many people kind of come in and, and, and chat with us, it's obviously been a little bit difficult with COVID and having mm. to kind of close um, during that level two period. Obviously, the team is um, kind of between operating from home and the office. Um, but a lot of uh, phone calls, a lot of emails, a lot of inquiries, um, mm. and it, it's, it's mainly been about for some like strategy development people looking at what they're doing differently people also wanting to do more things with the community um, but which really shows I guess creativity as this essential service that people are, are now delving in and, and, and looking to draw inspiration from um, mm. so uh, yeah a lot of phone calls a lot of emails um, and a lot of people I think just naturally inquisitive about what we're doing which is exciting mm. Because um, obviously during COVID, before my t- time with the beginning there, um, just a lot of the online initiatives that were started um, by the team that were really cool that allowed, I guess, creatives who wouldn't necessarily want to show their work online, sharing their work and their process. Yep. So it was a it's a real positive experience, I think, through that. What was it called? I just can't remember off the top of my head um, because you guys did ISO? the uh, Facebook line. Sorry, ISO Creation. Yeah, ISO creation. So I, I found that really, really good at a time when everybody was stuck at home to be able to see other people's work that you've never seen before because, you know, they you have, um, haven't been able to get to an exhibition or it's already passed and suddenly you're seeing people's work and uh, being part of it by them themselves showing it as well as, you know, having someone like Megan Dickinson uh, actually uh, doing interviews with people and putting that up. Yeah. Uh, Instagram, so um, Facebook, um, and so on. And th- that was a great initiative. I, I must say, ISO Creations was a very, very um, good initiative. And it really um, showed what uh, what the potential was uh, to see how to get people out of their shell uh, without mm. them, you know, being able to, well, come into my house, whereas it's like, this is my home, this is what I do, you know, and and... It's like um, they're being able to be invited into their home without them um, f- being uh, felt that they had to move out of the way to let you in, kind of thing. And it was on their, yeah. Yeah, it was on their own sort of initiative. Their terms, and I think that yeah. really, really worked. And that was, I must say, it was a really good initiative. Is there um, anything else that Creative Northland does that um, people need to know about? I guess we, we hold events, so we very much, much value youth development and, and strategy around that. So we hold um, two main events, well, three actually, but there's the North, um, Northland Youth Summit, um, which is focused on, on youth development there. And I guess it's allow, allowing young youth the potential that they could actually be in a creative industry. And I think ever more so now than ever, you know, you've got technology that allows I don't know, it's opened so many doors to job opportunities, you know, around that whole gaming sector, um, digital illustration, all these different things that you wouldn't probably think about, you know, a few years ago. But, yeah, so there's that there, um, and we're just looking at that, reviewing that, you know, it's a time of reviewing as well and looking what these events that couldn't potentially happen this year, but what they look like next year and how we can, can better serve the community around those. Um, but also Artbeat as well, which has a great, you know, aspect of cultural diversity there um and also i guess kind of like you know has that market vibe um but then also something for the whole family mm-hmm. so there's that there and then there's also the Fungane sculpture symposium which happens um every two years so it's a really well-known event um, that brings in a lot of sculptors from all around new zealand um to Fungane, um and all those works get auctioned off as well but we do so many more things. Um, the offering of resources as well. Um, our website's currently under construction, but you can probably go on there and, and see a few of the resources, such as the PA systems, mm-hmm. the tables, beanbags, projectors, um, so much more as well. Uh, what else? So there's marketing events. Um, yeah, just come in and have a conversation with us um, and we can get the ball rolling, basically. And that's the thing. It's like... Um... You know, when you see an organization, you have no idea what they do until you're actually in there and having that conversation about, okay, I, I think I need this, I need that, and are you able to, and you're like, I provide this, and you're like, well, there might be other people that we can put you in 
part of, I mean, get you in contact with. And I think that's the great thing of the whole idea of in kind. I, um, I found the in kind process of what CN does, um, Credit Northland does, so much more uh, beneficial to what we do. Sometimes more than the money because it's the it's like like the chairs and tables. It's like the, actually having to go out and hire t chairs and tables is mm. you know in the hundreds, and you're sort of thinking, well, well, they already have it, you know, and you've got to organize it. So I think um, the in kind process, um, and also the other thing is that there is, like you said, there's other people that are willing to actually give businesses that might be willing to give uh, funds yeah. or other uh, um, things that are needful without even you and you know us as artists knowing what's out there for us and i think having yeah. the, yourselves having the contact is much more um easier to pr um, get a hold of than to us approaching everybody and saying you know and sometimes um having an organization like yourselves be out there at the forefront of helping artists is amazing um all right so in closing um final last words oh just happy father's day to all those fathers um i guess yeah my dad he kind of introduced me to photography and the world of comics he used to collect world comic mega, um, comics and classics um so it was really interesting from a creative point of view growing up and um yeah the fascination about storytelling through imagery yeah um, but yeah, just come and visit us at our new premise. Um, once a level, we're in no level or level one. Uh, just see our mm. railway station down Railway Street in Whangarei there. Yeah. Excellent. So thank you. I don't want to take too much of your time. It's Friday night. And uh, for people who don't know, uh, I don't know myself, there was a power cut because somebody ran into uh, ran their car into a pole. And the lights have just come on, as you can see behind um, Olivia there. Um, but we, she's been um, using candles to light her way for this um, <laughs> most part of this uh, go, um, conversation. So thank you so much, Olivia. Um, have a good week. Have a good Sunday night. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I really appreciate um, you taking the time to actually talk to us about what you do, who you are, and also about um, Creative Northland. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fangane. Thank you, Aru. Awesome. Kakite na ano, everybody. Uh, we'll see you next time from beautiful Whangarei. And wherever you are, be safe, take care of yourselves. And again, happy Father's Day.